Hi, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us for the Q&A of California Landslide. I hope everyone enjoyed the film, and please remember that this film is available for an audience award, so don't forget to vote and rate all of the films that you watch when you're finished. I want to start off by thanking um, the sponsors of this film, Madonna Inn, KBEC News Talk 920 AM, Films for Good through Bob and Christine Williams, and I also want to thank our major sponsors, BHE Renewables, KSBY, American General Media, Wine Country Radio, and The Crush 92.5. We really couldn't do this without your sponsorship, so we greatly appreciate it. And now for the heart of the matter, I'm really excited to introduce our two guests, the filmmakers. Um, are, they're both writers and directors on this wonderful film, Dana Richardson and Sarah Zentz. Sarah also narrated the film. And I wanna thank you both so much for doing this Q&A and giving our uh, virtual audience an opportunity to hear firsthand from you some insight into this wonderful film. We're going to try to keep our conversation to about 10 or 12 minutes. Uh, which is what we did when we were meeting in real, you know, person. So my first question is, where are you located today? Right now we're in South Bay, Los Angeles. So it's a very different environment than um, Big Sur after living there. But um, we're happy to be safe and somewhere that we can still do this type of work with other people despite the pandemic. <laughs> well, that's great. And one of my first questions is really, at what point did you decide to produce this film? The rumblings, the rainstorms and mudslides, you saw that happening all along the coastline of Big Sur. And you were personally being increasingly threatened from your property. So, and this was of course back in the spring of 2017 for those not familiar with that. So at what point did you decide to start making a documentary about this subject? That's a great question. Um, I think that we, as documentary filmmakers, we kind of are always documenting things that are happening around us. So we were documenting it kind of without the intention of knowing what was to come or thinking that we were ever gonna share it um, as things kind of unfolded. But it really wasn't until the highway reopened. Um, so it was like over a year and a half after the, um, catastrophic collapse happened that we kind of were realizing that one we could go back and access this story and kind of put together the pieces that were missing and two that it kind of was um, a process that we felt like we needed to do personally to be able to move past it so um, it it took us a while to actually get to the place where we were really confident that we wanted to put ourselves through that and revisit and re-experience that sort of trauma, but um, it was basically like a year and a half after it happened that we really decided that we were gonna start making it. Oh, so around mid 2018. Yeah. Later than that. And how long did it take you to create the film? We put it together in about um, six months. Yeah, yeah so um, we went and pretty much as soon as the highway reopened, we started to go and get some of the footage that we were missing. and revisiting to see what it was like and it was still moving at the time um, we talked to some of the geologists and they were you know letting us know that they were still surveying and we got to see these kind of behind the scenes maps that showed how active it still was so it was a pretty um unsettling experience to even make ourselves go back to it but um we we were glad that we kind of like made it happen as soon as we could so that we could grab what other footage was actually needed to put it together and share it. Yeah, it was very, um, you know, very dramatic. And I, first of all, I wanna ask, why did you choose to narrate the film from your dog's perspective? <laughs> That's a great question. We were kind of prepared for that question as well, since um, it's kind of a unique um, storytelling vice that we chose. Um, and I think there's a, there's a couple of reasons why we kind of decided to go with that. One was that it was kind of a love story for Big Sur and our dog, ultimately, that was more of a personal experience of how it feels as a survivor's perspective to get through an experience like a natural disaster. And we wanted it to have a little bit more of a, um, of a levity sort of note that would open people up to hearing about such a controversial 
and pretty heavy topic of climate change and natural disasters. So we thought that it was both a coping mechanism um, for ourselves as filmmakers to kind of be able to use a voice that was an outside perspective in a way, but um, it was also kind of to appeal to a wider audience for them to kind of like hear a childlike perspective on what going through such a traumatic event was like. Were there any particular difficulties posed by choosing the dog as the <laughs> dog and Sarah as the narrating device? I, I hate being on camera. So for <laughs> me, it was like I Dana wanted it to be more that we were in front of the camera and I refused to do it because I was like, no, we're always behind it. Like, I don't want to be make a film about me. But it's so much easier to do it with Anika. She's like so pretty and people always are commenting like how whatever unique of a dog that she is and she really is kind of like a little human that um <laughs> Bichlas are known for being like velcro dogs and just being really kind of always by your side so for me I was like oh it's she, like she's like a better star and um but yeah it was difficult for to so it was still my voice so it was still us writing our story and sharing that story so for me, it was definitely like a difficult thing being so far away, like here in Los Angeles, it was the last thing we did was the narration mm -hmm. after we had moved out of the area. Um, and so for me, it was just like, I think it's a, it's a hard thing to talk about for sure that even though it was like not being on camera, that that was difficult to reshare that story for sure. Mm -hmm. yeah. What were your original goals with the film and do you feel you accomplished those goals? Our original goals were kind of twofold to um, raise awareness environmentally about the crisis that was going on globally, but really on a zoomed in perspective that would make people be able to grasp in a different way what's being called so often an existential crisis of the global climate change crisis that we kind of wanted to zoom in and make it more of a relatable story. Um, so we are seeing that so many, so much of the news coverage was really highlighting the larger economic impacts that we know impact as far as the businesses in San Luis Obispo, mm -hmm. as Big Sur is a major tourist destination, um, but it wasn't really, and we saw this for a lot of other disasters in the news that they were kind of just like the big event happened and then the economy is impacted, but they don't go really into a personal portrait. And we started to realize that other people were going through what we were going through so much in California, losing their homes and having to be displaced and going through the emotional process of finding support systems and all of that. So, you know, not just for landslides, it's like the wildfires were happening, you know, like the, they're super devastating, like all over like California from like Northern to Southern and there's the flooding mudslides in Santa Barbara. It's like, there's been a lot of natural disasters that have been happening to a lot of different people and affecting, you know, millions of people, it feels like throughout just like the state alone. So we also wanted it to be more of um, kind of a healing process for other people who had gone through similar experiences to watch like a zoomed in portrait to understand that this, we're not alone in this process. It does take on average three years, they say, for people with post um, disaster trauma to recover even to get back to a neutral in life where their business is back up and running and they're emotionally stable and everything. So we kind of, we learned a lot by going through it and making the film and we wanted other people to be more aware of that, that they're not alone and that we need to come together to find solutions both environmentally and as like a human problem. Mm -hmm. Clearly um, there is tension that you've created in this film as the rain and uh, is coming down and you see the cracks in the earth and you're waiting it out way up on the, on the mountaintop uh, overlooking Big Sur. And so was it difficult for you to recreate the tension that you experienced at the time? Definitely. Yeah. That was one of the most challenging parts of the filmmaking process was actually realizing that of course, we didn't at the time, like we said in the beginning, have the foresight that we were going to be putting this into a documentary. So we grabbed snippets of different moments, but the most traumatic experiences that we had behind the scenes weren't, we weren't grabbing our cameras and able to actually document that. So it was really difficult to put that together in a way that actually communicated what that was like to go through the 
the kind of climax moment of the film when we're actually escaping from the disaster while it happened. We didn't have a lot of footage of that actually happening. So it was pretty challenging to try to use both like other locals footage and stock footage and our own and some like kind of um, reenacted moments to be able to retell that um, that feeling of that moment actually. I feel that you clearly succeeded in creating tension. You know, Thank there were you. moments <laughs> where it was just building and you're thinking, well, are you gonna lose the house? Or are you gonna be able to escape? And I thought you handled that deftly. Um, did your house survive? It looked like it might have still been there from that, you know, from the aerial view that we saw. Yes you know? and no. The um, it's uninhabitable at this point. It's uninhabitable. The um, the water pipes that were leading to it were completely wiped out, and the access road was wiped out, as well as the ground was slipping so much that trees started to fall in through the house. So um the structure is technically not buried alive but it definitely became clear that it was not safe to or really even technically possible to live there anymore mm -hmm. so um even on the last uh you know few months that we were there we were only able to get in and out by foot um which was about you know a mile and a half each way up a steep road so um it became clear that we were being pushed out by the land <laughs> absolutely yeah um, did you rely on drone is that drone footage that we were seeing and where yeah. did, is that your drone or did you get no. that drone footage from us uh, you know highway patrol or Cal yeah. Fire, whatever we worked with Caltrans and some um, private um, videographers who got the drone footage um so that was really helpful. We don't actually um, do drone flying or have drone licenses ourselves, but um, that really gave a better perspective on actually as it was unfolding, they did a great job of getting some of that footage. We remember being actually up at the house in the little off-grid cabin and looking up and seeing these drones flying by as they were documenting it. So <laughs> we got to understand what that footage looked like was kind of neat. <laughs> yes. Um, and so what we're, we're going to have to wrap this up in just a few minutes. So is there anything that you would like to add that um, about the filmmaking process or about the outcome um, that, that we haven't talked about? Because this is such a short interview. Yeah, I mean, that's a great question. I think that overall, we just want people to understand that there is such a huge problem here with the um, impact of natural disasters and the increasing incidence of that and that we realize that there's a lot of controversy and debate over um, the you know different political backgrounds and different perspectives on whether climate change exists and all these things but we don't want we want people's walk away to be a heartfelt and loving perspective for one another and for the environments that we inhabit. We think that Big Sur especially is a really special place to preserve ecologically and um, for just a, a kind of place that a lot of people but have been able to retreat and appreciate the natural ecology. And we think that, you know, even just in the last couple of weeks, there was another major landslide there that is making the news that took out a big chunk of Highway 1. And during the almost decade that we lived there, it was a really challenging um, place to live for the community. And it's getting more difficult as the environment um, impacts the community's ability to survive. So we just want to bring attention to that and support to that and people who are visiting um, to be respectful of the land mm -hmm. um, and to realize that it's, it's not an isolated incident, that all of us are in danger of having our homes and livelihoods wiped out and that it's an important thing to do our daily efforts of whatever we can to try to mitigate that change. Clearly you are both uh, strong advocates of social um, to you know to share the social and environmental impact of natural disasters around the world. Yeah. So are you working on another film in this genre? Yeah. I mean, we're, um, we're kind of in the research and development phase. We're actually working on a book that we think might become our next documentary feature film. 
And it's really um, focused on um, carbon sequestering. So kind of along the same um, topic, but for specifically food growing systems and regenerative agriculture, mm -hmm. um, there's a huge amount of um, environmental impact that our food growing systems have on what we can do to help slow down the change of the climate. And um, mm -hmm. so that's, that's kind of what we're working on right now. And that's um, all of our past feature documentaries have also kind of been along that same vein of trying to provide solutions and not focus just on the problems, but more solutions of um, environmental problems and our food system. So we're, we're continuing on that thread. <laughs> That's terrific. And so you're a little bit out on that one. You're still working yes. on the book and then with the movie. And do you ever envision yourself on a personal level getting back to Big Sur? Because I can only imagine living where you did for a dozen years yeah. and then living in LA. Yeah. Massive. It's massive change. Yeah. 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 And of course, too, we got to LA and then it shut down in, in the middle of the pandemic. So it kind of feels like we're living in like isolation again, like as if it was big city, that we're not in a big city. But um, it's definitely, I think that we immediately after we always said, you know, no, we're never going back to big Sur, And I think that that might stay true <laughs> in time. But I think that, you know, even like looking at properties, we definitely look at them different now of like, whether they like have any, what are the dangers and things like that. So I think it's a lifelong impact that it had on us to be thinking about natural disasters as a, a thing to be careful of um, where you're living and <laughs> where you're buying property. So yeah, we kind of realized there's no safe place of that you can be completely avoiding the impacts of natural disasters, but Big Sur I dream of it constantly. Mm -hmm. It will always hold a special place in both of our hearts. And that mm -hmm. at the moment, it felt like the best thing that we could do for it was to leave it alone and um, visit it and respect it from sort of an outsider perspective. So we're definitely planning on revisiting it. <laughs> yeah. Well, great. Well, I just want to thank you again for taking this opportunity to chat with us today. I love it when our audience is able to meet the filmmakers and the producers and the people who put all their passion and energy into it. And clearly you did, you both did a fabulous, fabulous job. I love the dog perspective. I have two dogs myself. So, and thank goodness they're being quiet at the moment. Oh, can we, when we see your dog? <laughs> you did a great job. We're very proud of you. <laughs> <laughs> and so anyway, I want to also thank our, our sponsors, Madonna Inn, KVEC News Talk, 920 AM, Films for Good, through Bob and Christine Williams, and our major sponsors, BAP Renewables, uh, KSBY, American General Media, Wine Country Radio, and The Crush 92.5. Don't forget to vote everyone. And thank you again for joining us today. Really enjoyed it and good luck in the future. Hope this pandemic ends, you know, soon. Yeah. We're all for all for many reasons. Take care. <laughs>